Thanks, Ben, for this introduction. I also want to thank all the staff from the Orbit Institute, Matt, Sarah, uh, Aaron, Connor, for the organization of this workshop. I also and especially want to thank uh, Hisham for the nice food he prepared, which we already ate and which we can eat uh, later on. And uh, I want you to uh, that all of you came here and I hope we will have a fruitful um, and interesting uh, discussion afterwards. It's really a workshop. Workshop means for me that you all have to contribute your opinions and uh, this will be very helpful for us which uh, we speak uh, here and present our uh, three sites which are all situated next to the Sea of Galilee and which have a similar history uh, as you will see, especially in the late Bronze Age. And this uh, was the reason why I had the idea to make this workshop about the late Bronze Age or end of the late Bronze Age in, uh, around the Sea of Galilee. So we have three sites and um, I especially want to thank uh, Sam Wolf and Ami Golani for contributing uh, the last lecture, yeah, the last, last of the three lectures uh, about their site of Tel Dover, which is nearly unpublished. Nearly. <laughs> <laughs> and Asaf uh, Kleiman, where is he? Ah, oh, yeah. Uh, for uh, presenting his uh, material of the late Bronze Age at Tel Khadar. Uh, all three sites, or at least the uh, late Bronze Age of all three sites, is nearly unpublished, so it's uh, something new, and I think this is a good starting point for, um, uh, for good discussions. Uh, sorry, I forgot to use this, uh, but for recording, yeah, so hopefully it works. So let's start with Telkin Road. Telkin Road, or in Arabic, uh, Tel Urim, is located on the northwestern shore of the Sea of Galilee um, in northern Israel. It rests on a natural limestone hill, which drops very steeply towards the southwest, but slopes more gently on the other sides. The southeastern slope reaches down to Lakeshore. The whole mount, including the natural hill, covers about 10 hectares in size, but because of the construction of the pumping station of the Israeli, uh, Israeli National Water Company, Mikor Road, in the 1960s, almost the entire west, uh, southwestern half of the Tel, including the surroundings of the Spring of Etine at its foot, is inaccessible for archaeological excavations. Between Telkin Road and uh, the northern outskirts of Tiberias it extends the very fertile plain of Ginozar, lined by the hills of Galilee on, the, on three sides and touching the shore of the Sea of Galilee on the east. Several wadis also run down from the hills, crossing the plain and ending in the lake. So uh, to the northwest, uh, northeast of Telkin Road, just around the corner, following the shoreline, one, fi um, one finds a, a smaller plain with many uh, natural springs at Etapka. Uh, Tel Arim has ideal water resources. Uh, uh, the Sea of Galilee is not uh, approachable because huge stones are blocking the seaside uh, of the Tel area. However, in the northwest, one of the richest springs in the country is located in Etine. Directly northeast of the Tel are the seven springs of Heptabigon, or Tapka. Telkin Road not only has excellent conditions for agriculture and water supply, but also for trade activities. The main ancient north-south road, often called the Via Maris, bypasses the Tel and continues up to the Chazor and further on to northern Syria, Anatolia and Mesopotamia. Whoever controlled the site benefited from the bypassing traffic. Such a uh, location made uh, Telkin Road st uh, strategically interesting and played a major role in the history and development of the site. The site was settled from the early Bronze Age to the Ottoman period. In the center of the excavations, which took place in, in the 80s, stood the Iron Age two remains on the Acropolis, while the excavations in the 90s and in the early third millennium concentrated mainly on the Iron Age one period. This table presents the actual official stratigraphy and chronology, which had been published several times. 
the final, final analysis will definitely be updated and changed a little bit, but it's too early to present final results. I just started uh, my research during uh, my stay here in Jerusalem. As you can see, there are only some settlement continuity between the Middle and Late Bronze Age and between Iron Age 1 and partly also Iron Age 2. Despite uh, the excellent position of Taken Road, gaps are more dominant than settlement continuities. Paul Kage was the first, uh, first explored the site in 1911, who, by the way, correctly identified it with the biblical site of Kinneret. Before him, Herbert Kerak, situated at the southern end of the Lake of Galilee, was usually identified with Kinneret. However, as you all know, Herbert Kerak's settlement history does not coincide with the textual evidence of Kinneret. Albright and Dalman, who are both normally considered to be the first ones to identify Tel El Oreme with Kinneret, obviously only published Kerak's identification after his death, without mentioning his name. Kage died early in the year 1922, at only 41 years old. Therefore, he was unable to publish an excavation report on everything from his stick seems to be lost. Albright once mentioned that Kage not only found pottery, but also some metal items. In 1932, Robert Koeppel started some small trial digs on the tell, and in 1939, another excavation revealed some walls. These excavators evidently did not understand the results. In 1964, Gershon Edelstein excavated some small areas on the tell, recovering mainly the later journal, which will be published uh, in our excavation report now by Sam Wolf. Large-scale excavations started in 1982 under the direction of Volkmar Fritz from the University of Mainz. He was later at the German Protestant Institute of Archaeology here in Jerusalem, and finally at the University of Gießen. The first series of excavations from 1982 to 95, uh, 85 concentrated its work on the Acropolis. Here are some remains of the Iron Age 1 settlement, strata 6 to 4 were discovered. Along with a tower from the 9th century BC, a small, well-fortified settlement from the second part of the 8th century BC, destroyed by the Assyrians, in 732, some houses from the 7th century, an Assyrian in the Persian palace, and a farmhouse from the Hellenistic period. During a second series of campaigns, 1995 to 1999, the focus of the renewed excavation went downhill. The main aim of these digs was almost exclusively to get more information about the settlement that was one of the largest sites of, the, of this period in the whole country. The Kinneret Regional Project, being a joint project of the University of Bern, Helsinki, Leiden and Mainz, started in 2001 after the retirement and death of Volkmar Fritz. Our main aim was to clarify some questions connected with the RNH1 settlement and to also publish the excavation report of the seasons from 1995 onwards. Additionally and independently, uh, and independently, Yaka and Wynn did some small, mostly early Bronze Age excavations in 1982. Due to the concentration on the Iron Age 1 period, only on some spots were older remains excavated and those limited areas were not excavated systematically. Unfortunately, we do not have larger archi architectural remains from the Bronze Age, but we know that the site was walled during the EB or the MB uh, period. It appears that, that during the Bronze Age, the whole hill was settled. However, our data are really limited in perspective, in this perspective. From pottery analysis, we can reconstruct the following pre-Iron Age settlement history. The site was founded during the Stratum 10, that is the EB1 or uh, 2 period, and seems to have been established during the EB2 period, Stratum 9. After a gap of a, over a thousand years, the site was resettled during MB2 period, Stratum 8, and continued to be settled in LB1, Stratum 7. According to my present day understanding of the excavations, I do not agree with the, this division in two different strata, 8 and 7. As far as I can actually see, no destruction exists at the end of the MB, but there was a continuous settlement activity lasting into the LB1 period. Only a limited number of comp uh, complete vessels from the MB period confirm this assumption. 
Normally, many vessels can be easily restored after destruction. But this is not the case uh, at the end of the MB period in Telkin Road. Most of the pottery survived of the LB1 period, as I will show in a minute. Excavated architecture of strata 8 and 7 shows strong continuation and should only be divided in phases and not into strata. Nevertheless, the chronological system with two different strata is mentioned in all preliminary excavation reports, and therefore we should call this stratum 8-7. Area H is the best to understand the limited archa uh, architectural remains of the MB to LB1 period. An older city wall was partly covered by the Iron Age uh, 1 city wall, which you can see here. Uh, therefore, the width of the older city wall cannot be identified. I'm not completely sure if the city wall was established during the Middle Bronze Age too, or if the settlers only reused and strengthened an older EB uh, city wall at this site. Further research has to clarify this question. Some buildings inside the wall can definitely be dated to the end of the MB2 period and to the LB1 period. Pottery finds are much more informative than the meager rest of the architecture. MB and LB pottery has been found in the areas G, R, N, U, and very intensively in area H, which you have uh, just seen. All the LB pottery can be dated into uh, the late Bronze Age 1 period, but many forms are in the good continuation of the MB2 period. This allows the thesis that the site was abundant at the end of the LB1 period, or during the LB1 period. The reasons why the site was not settled in the LB2 period were discussed at the end of this workshop. While the newer excavations mostly, were mostly interested in younger periods uh, and the rate, uh, late Bronze Age results are comp uh, comparatively, uh, comparatively meager, there exist some interesting finds found during the ex uh, before the excavation started. Most importantly is a fragment of an Egyptian stela discovered in 1928 uh, on the surface and originally published by Orbert and Rowe. It, was, it is made of bas uh, local basalt stone and it's uh, 24 by 18 centimeters in size and 16 centimeters thick. In a careful new analysis, Stefan Wimmer not only proposed a part, partially new reading, but suggests that this is not an official royal Egyptian inscription, but an inscription of an Egyptian official who exerted some function at the site of Kinneret. He dates the inscription with some probability to the time of Tutmosis III. Another Egyptian find, also found on surface, is a scarab of Queen Tie, the wife of Pharaoh Amenhotep III. Above a dozen of similar scarabs mentioning Teje were found at several sites in the Levant. She was a very influential queen and an important person for this period. Both the stela fragment and the scarab are proofs for Egyptian presence at Taken Road in the 15th and early, very early 14th century BC. The scarab is likely from, a very, uh, from the very early years of the queen and is... Um, uh, the, la uh, the latest datable proof for settlement activities in Telkin Road in the, the Late Bronze Age. Therefore, in combination with the Late Bronze Age 1 pottery, Telkin Road was likely settled in the 80s or even 70s of the 14th century BC. This curve uh, helps us in dating the end of the Late Bronze Age 1 period in uh, this area, on uh, this side of the Sea of Galilee. A date a little bit uh, later than the traditional end of uh, around 1400 mentioned in many reference books. So that's what I can contribute to from my side. And now we're here on the next side. So we go clockwise around uh, to Tel Hadar, some kilometers uh, on the east. And Asaf will continue. Okay, welcome everybody. Um, this is the last lecture and I hope we'll have some discussion at the end if, if you like. First of all, I'd like to thank uh, Wolfgang for organizing this uh, workshop and for inviting us to speak. Um, I'm uh, Amir Gulani. I work at the Israel Antiquities Authority along with Sam Wolf, who used to work at the Israel Antiquities Authority, now retired. 
both of us are going to present a little bit of what we found at excavations conducted at Tel Dover, a site that doesn't have really a very long history of research because we were basically the first excavation to touch upon the site. The reasons for that we'll soon see. And we may also be the last unless something drastic happens. Um, so without further ado, how do I get this thing moving? Yep. So Tel Dover, which is a site that many of you really don't know that much, uh, primarily because it's never been excavated, as I alluded to earlier, but also because it's not something you generally see, even when we drive the road, unless you're driving by through Jordan uh, on the road, then you don't really see the site. But at any rate, you all recognize uh, more or less the, uh, the geographical setting here. Of course, you have the Sea of Galilee, the Jordan River coming up through here. Rafi, here's Bet Yerach, of course. And you will have uh, the Yarmouk River. Whoops, Yarmouk River over here. Excuse me. OK, the Yarmouk, here we go. Here is the confluence of the Yarmouk River into the Jordan River. OK, the Sea of Galilee, of course. Tel Hadar would be here. Tel Aramekin Road would be somewhere over here. OK, and Tel Dover is here. So as you can see, while most of us usually drive road and either take a left or a right. Tel Dover is usually far off to the side and we usually never see it, never pass by it, and that's why we usually often never heard of it. But the interesting thing is that Tel Dover, located on the path of the Yarmouk River, essentially is found at the point where you leave the pass of the Yarmouk River and empty out into the lower Jordan Valley over here. So in this sense, Tel Dover really has a kind of a strategic position. Not strategic in the sense of being easily defendable, but being strategic in the sense of being in a place that many people would have to pass through. And I think that this is crucial in the understanding of the history of the site as well. From another vantage point, you can see here the site of Tel Dover over here. This is the eastern shore of the Sea of Galilee the Jordan Valley, Lower Jordan Valley. Here is the uh, place where the Armouk River comes out. And the thing is with Tel Dover, located just over here, is that it sits upon a place where at this point, you essentially have to cross the Armouk River of today and making your way up the other side. Here at this point, one could then decide if they wanted to go up this uh, path, up the Armouk uh, 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 stream bed, or if they wanted to begin to climb up into the, va into the hills and then reach the area of Gadara, which is over here, and Pella, which is also not far away. So in this sense, again, you can see that uh, Dover stands at a very crucial point and essentially guards a kind of a fjord, a, a place where people needed to pass, needed to cross here and further on on their way other, either to northern, northern Jordanian highlands or uh, bypassing the Golan Heights further to the northeast on the way to Damascus. You can see this better now also in this slide which gives you the position of as one begins to move up. Here is the, the Jordan Valley and here you can see the pass or the, 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 the canyon of the Amuk River. And you can see the situation of Tel Dover right here, right at this point. Somebody would have to, if they wanted to keep on going up because this area is all cliffs, they would have to cross over to this, where today is a, an existing road over here in Jordan now. They'd have to cross over just at the point where Tel Dover is situated. Um, in this respect, we can now understand, and this is a picture of the uh, site at the end of excavations in 1997 as a result of the um, peace accords with Jordan. Jordan was essentially supposed to build, well, we were supposed to build along with Jordan a dam right here. Whoops. We're supposed to build a dam right here, more or less, a dam to catch the waters of the Armouk River, a dam which would allow Jordan to have more water for irrigation, 
uh, a dam on the Armuk River. And because of the uh, projected plans for building this dam, then the uh, project of the Tel Dover uh, excavations was initiated. The head of the project, the main excavator, Tel Dover, the head of the excavations was Alexander On, who some of you may have known. I would presume that many of you did not. Here is Alexander. Unfortunately, Alexander passed away in 2012. He was an amazing archaeologist, a fantastic mentor for me and for many other archaeologists as well. And unfortunately, he never really lived to see the, uh, the, uh, pr the publication of his project. And so today, uh, it's a huge excavation. Uh, some of it has been published. And we, Sam and I, are now working on the publication of the Late Bronze and Iron Age levels. Here we can see, at the end of excavations, the, uh, the, the situation where you have here, uh, here is, of course, the, up the lower Jordan Valley, the Yarmouk River, here beginning the Golan Heights, not the Golan Heights, this is already Jordan, okay? The Yarmouk essentially becomes a international and geographical border between Israel, Jordan, and later on also Syria. Um, and you can see here that in terms of the site itself, it has two major components. First of all, it has a tell, a classic tell, which we'll call here the Acropolis over here. And it has a lower terrace, which is all of this region over here. As you can see, this road over here is essentially the boundary, meaning this is the road which the military patrols, meaning that the area from the road to the river, which essentially is still under Israeli control, is essentially also a military area, meaning you can't go there. And that area, of course, is where, as you would expect, Tel Dover is today. And that's why it's rather, unfortunately, it's inaccessible um, uh, at present. And this, the upper city, or the Acropolis, a small uh, mound of about five or seven, eight dunams has never been excavated. However, it has been severely damaged by various uh, engineering activities of the uh, Israeli army. What has not been damaged is the amazing lower terrace, which is all of this area, the sort of wedged area over here. And this is where excavation is essentially concentrated because the dam which is supposed to be somewhere here, was essentially due to essentially flood all of this area. And because of the, the, the uh, pr projected flooding, that is why we initiated uh, salv rescue excavations in this area. The Yarmouk on one side of the lower terrace, and over here you can see on the other side a, a cliff, a basalt cliff, which essentially makes this position rather indefensible because this is a very convenient area to come and overlook all of the lower terrace. So you have an upper city, the Acropolis, and you have a lower city. Um, that is the basic situation of Tel Dover and the excavations, which were, as I said before, conducted primarily in the lower terrace, essentially were able to identify at least 10 uh, stratum, big strata beginning from late Neolithic, the Wadi Rabbah, continuing the Chalcolithic, and then, of course, a long period of abandonment, the uh, LB1, which we'll call here LB1B, stratum 8, which is going to be the focus of, uh, the, the, of my talk here. Afterwards, the Iron Age 1, which has many, many phases. Um, and after the Iron Age I, of course, another period of abandonment, and we get into the Hellenistic, Stratum VI, Roman, Byzantine, Umayyad, Abbasid, Mameluk, and there you have it. Most of the archaeological history of the country ensconced uh, at one site. Um, so we're going to concentrate primarily in this portion, which is primarily Stratum VIII, has three phases. I won't go into too much stratigraphic detail, but just to give you an idea of the lower terrace, and again, we're speaking of the lower terrace primarily because the Acropolis has never been excavated uh, so far. Um, this is a general plan of what it looks like, and you can see here in these various plans the remains of many, many, many periods. It's quite a mess in terms of the, uh, 
the uh, stratigraphy and the architecture. But one of the things you do see here is a kind of a Khan dating from a much later period. And this, again, ties in with the fact that Tel Dover is a place where many uh, caravans and many people who are going up or down the Yarmouk River Valley could essentially stop and, uh, uh, for a place uh, to rest. Uh, the Iron Age remains, which again, I will not go into any great detail, in one area, a large area relatively of the lower terrace, but not a very large area in terms of what was, pub what was excavated in general, are quite dense. There's a lot of building remains. I won't go into any detail, but you can see that there's five phases. And this area, essentially, uh, the settlement during the Iron One, interspersed between being a densely built up area and between being a burial ground. So here again, we have periods of so-called, I could say, abandonment for burial, the area used for burial purposes, and later on being resettled. We, so we presume that during that time, the burials, these are the Iron Age burials, essentially meant that there was a major, the major settlement was confined to the Acropolis, or the small tell of, um, of Dover at that time. But the main, the main thing, of course, we want to see and speak of is the Late Bronze Age remains in the Lower Terrace. These were achieved or reached primarily in this area, Okay, the, um, lower, the upper city, the Acropolis, is over here. Here is the cliff I mentioned earlier, the Armouk River. Most of the late bronze remains were in this area, a little bit in this area, but here is where most of them were found. Just to give you an idea of the, the very complicated stratigraphy and of the uh, depth of remains, this is just a selection of some of the sections that we have. Uh, the yellow is essentially late Bronze Age remains. You can make out that sometimes the walls were preserved to several courses in height. And you can also make out that there is oftentimes a buildup of surfaces, a buildup of debris in many, many places. This, of course, the yellow is the late bronze. And the other colors range from Iron Age to later Hellenistic, Roman, Byzantine. And over here, you can also get an idea because this is a Roman wall, and you can imagine some of us digging down here with three meters of Roman wall towering above our heads, all in place. And so here we are still in place. Um, as for the Late Bronze Age remains, even though they were really accessed in only a few locales, because remember, you had to go through all this iron, Byzantine, Hellenistic, uh, Iron Age, there's a lot of it. Uh, the Late Bronze Age remains essentially were accessed in only a few locales. And even though the plan of this structure may appear rather impressive, and I think it is, and I think it's also accurate, still, if you take a close look, you'll notice that mo most of the walls are actually reconstructed. But what we do have is we have the remains of a few architectural elements I will point out here the remains of this wall and this wall, a very large pillar base in between, which appear to suggest the possibility that we have here a massive entrance into a very large building, a very large building of which we can't say very much of, but it's six and a half meters uh, wide. It is apparently something like over 12 and a half meters, at least from this end to this end. Uh, of another portion of a wall here and here with a cobbled or a pavement, rough stone pavement here, here, another portion of a wall here, portion of a wall here, and with those portions and a fragment of a uh, door jamb that was found here that was not very photogenic, but believe me, it does exist. We reconstruct a large building with a massive entrance over here facing east another entrance here, south, okay? Uh, the building has a kind of a back room which is very roughly built over here, has several phases. This is where much of the buildup was. Uh, occupational debris was, was really found here. Much of this area was severely disturbed by Iron Age remains, uh, then, of course, by Roman and then by Byzantine remains. So it's really little peepholes, and through these little peepholes, we were able to reconstruct what we were able to reconstruct. In addition to this building, which I believe is pretty massive proportion, proportions, because look at some of these stones are really quite um, large boulders. We also have a large wall here, several 
also very large walls here, really monumental architecture of which we only have little snippets of and so we can only reconstruct it in a very limited sense. This is just uh, some photographs to show you what these essentially uh, things look like in, in reality. This is of course here, over here, and this is over here. So the bulk of the Late Bronze Age remains in terms of the architecture is what I'm showing you here. Also in addition, okay, you can see over here we have the, we have a massive wall here. There appears to be a door jamb here. Maybe another one can be possibly here. There's a very wide entranceway over here. We could theorize, if you want, fantasize that a huge enclosure of which this is the entrance. There are some here. There's a very large building here that faces to the east. And apparently the method of construction, the scope of construction, um, along with some of the associated finds may uh, indeed suggest that we're looking at a very, very large public building. Again, it's not on the Acropolis, it's in the lower city. When we look at this building and try to see if there are any parallels to it and other buildings of a public slash cultic nature um, in the Southern Levant during the LB1, we're really at a loss. I mean, you do have oftentimes buildings that have massive entrances with two pillars or one pillar. You have Migdal temples with massive entrances, but there's none that have the same plan, of course, and though there's elements such as a large hall and a back room, like this uh, late MB2, uh, early LB1 temple at Bet She'an, um, still, even in terms of um, temple architecture, public architecture, no two buildings are really exactly the same. So uh, this could be a one of a kind, but then again, we don't know all the entire plan of it, so it remains rather conjectural. Um, in terms of what this building could have functioned, we may hesitantly suggest that this building with its massive architecture with its peculiar plan facing east, massive entrance facing east, could be possibly a temple. With this in mind, we can note that a, um, a cylinder seal with a Metanian type cylinder seal has been found in, within the precincts of this building and those who understand in these types of cylinder seals have assured me that this kind of Metanian cylinder seal is usually connected with cultic um, architecture throughout our region, okay? In addition, we have um, several fragments of what is commonly called a shivaton or a seven-cupped uh, seven lamp, which uh, these things have been researched uh, in the past and they are also uh, oftentimes found uh, in cultic contexts, such as, for example, many such fragments of such vessels in the uh, MB2 temple of Nahariya, where they appear um, in other contexts as well to be a part of the Canaanite cult uh, of that time. This is a an example of a whole, vessel, whole one, not from Dover, but from another site, just to give you an idea of what these things could have looked like. Um, so when we look at the general picture in terms of the stratigraphy and try to at least compare Dover with other sites, first of all, when we're speaking of the LB1B, and as the date we'll soon speak of also, and we brought some, Sam uh, also brought some ceramics for us to look at in, uh, in addition. One of the interesting things, and I think this is the uh, main point that can tie us all together here along with Hadar and Areme, is that you have an occupational gap. These occupational gaps, of course, are very convenient because they are highly suggestive of what was, could have gone on, and they're also convenient in terms of the dating because um, you don't have to worry so much about later forms essentially filtering down into your, 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 um, your loci, even though you can see that many of them are disturbed. So if we look at the 
stratigraphic situation, we can see tel dover stratum 8, the LB1B, the same stratum 6, or maybe even 7, if I now understand correctly, okay, at Telerema, stratum 7 at, excuse me, 7 uh, at Telerema, stratum 6, if I'm not, uh, if I understood correctly, at Teladar, stratum 15, um, I wouldn't say at this point 14, but I'd say 15 because, as we'll soon see, one of the things that typifies the uh, ceramic assemblage at Tel Dover in stratum 8 is the presence of chocolate on whiteware, a specific ceramic class which is generally held to be indicative of the very, very end of the LB, uh, of the, excuse me, of the MB period and continuing on into the very, very beginning of the um, LB1. Uh, but in addition, we have, of course, where is this last one? Excuse me. Yep. Okay, what's the last one? It's Betsaida, which I'm likening to, no, not the last, not that one. For this, Engen. Okay, Betsha'an, R1B, is essentially the stratum that we can, that we can um, compare to as well. I didn't say it was missing. I'm just saying that I'm comparing. No, yeah, I'm 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 comparing essentially the late Bronze Age strata. Okay, I'm trying at least to say R1B at Betsha'an like Tel Dover uh, eight. Um, now, if we look at the settlement pattern, we can see here the sites that we've uh, been discussing today: Hadar, Tel Hadar, uh, Tel Aramik and Rot, Tel Dover and of course, Hatsor. This is the settlement situation during the MB2. Lots of settlements, okay? And, and the passage into the LB, but unfortunately I can't tell you which LB at this time, but in general LB, we see a settlement situation where the Golan Heights is almost empty. And this picks up a little bit during the Iron Age 1. Now, the thing that ties these four sites together is that they all have LB1B. The thing that ties these three sites together is they have LB1B but do not have LB2. Okay? So there's obviously some kind of something's going on at the passage from the L, at the end of the LB1B. Something is going on whereas these three sites are being essentially abandoned and then only resettled in the Iron Age uh, one. What that th something is, is maybe something that we will want to talk about later on. And if we look at a little bit of what the road systems could be, and this alludes again to what I began my talk with in looking at the geographical situation, we see here essentially the uh, road going from Betcha'an and it doesn't go to Dover, but it bypasses and goes around the western shore through Kinrat, continuing to Hatsor and bypassing the possible marshes of the Hula Valley, going up to the Golan. Another way, okay, which could be relevant for the LB1B and also the Iron Age 1, but apparently not for the LB2, uh, would be going around this way, maybe connecting to the Hatsor, but going up this way. And I say this because Hadar was not settled, apparently, in the LB2. And the other thing is that, and this is really the thing that I would like to propose, that during at least the LB1B, there was another road. And this is the road that went up through the Armuk Valley, okay? And essentially could have gone over here up to Pella and Gadara later on in much later periods, but could also, of course, have continued onwards to Damascus. Those taking up that road would have had to go by Tel Dover. Maybe because of this reason that the site was essentially put in, was in existence when it was in existence. Okay, so maybe that road really doesn't exist very much prior to the LB1B. Maybe that road was really in use only during the periods of settlement at Tel Dover at least in the periods that we're speaking of here, primarily the LB1B and later on the Iron Age 1. Thank you very much.
to discussion. So, but it doesn't work. Ah, okay. So, but the area of the Sea of, of Galilee was densely settled during the Ambi period. Altogether, 164 uh, sites on this map were, dense, uh, were uh, settled during this period more than in any other pre Hellenistic period. We saw it already on a similar uh, slide in your lecture. Equally, the steep decline from the high number of MB sites to the very few number of LB sites is remarkable. But this is not the topic of this workshop. Anyone who is interested in may hear more about this during the next ASO meeting uh, in San Diego. During the LB period, only very few sites were settled directly along sh the shore of the Sea of Galilee, mainly Tel Hadar and Tel Kinrut. There is a remarkable, a remarkable change in the transition from LB1 to LB2. Only a few sites survived, among them the cosmopolitan city of Hazor, as well as a small, uh, smaller sites uh, 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 such as Nachal Rakat Safed or Chirbet Kadish. Other sites uh, such as Kinere Tel Hadar and Tel Dubea were abundant, as we heard in the last hour. Nevertheless, there is no steep decline in this period, and the number of sites even increased from 17 to 23 sites, all of which were rather small, with the exception of Hatzor. New sites like Khan Khitin and Tel Naam, Yin Am, were founded. For me, this abundance of settlements, a contemporaneous new foundation of sites, is a marker for a change either due to historic, uh, political situation or the economy or trade activities or similar reasons, which we'll hopefully discuss in a minute. Hmm? Evidently, no destruction levels exist at the uh, excavated sites at the end of the LB1 period. Uh, let us now have a look on the historical information about this area. First of all, many sites are mentioned in the town list of Tuk Moses III, who, according to his reports, conquered the region and destroyed many sites. Our next data are from the period of Pharaoh uh, Amenhotep II. Papyrus uh, Leningradensis 1116a includes a list of Palestinian messengers who arrived in Memphis and who were supported with beer. The free beer in the Orbright fridge has a long tradition, <laughs> as you can see. <laughs> While we do not know the exact route uh, of the first campaign of this pharaoh against Mitanni, during his second campaign he reached Anaharat uh, at the uh, as, a, as a northernmost town, being identified with Chirbet and Muchachash, Tel Rechesh, some kilometers southwest of the Sea of Galilee. Additionally, I already mentioned in my lecture the scarab of Queen Teye found in Kinneret. Our next historical sources about this region are the Amana letters. Surprisingly, only two sites are mentioned on the western side of the Sea of Galilee, Chatzor and Bechan, while the area east of the river is generally called the land of Garu, the former name of Golan. Evidently, something happened during the early years of the Amana period. After the already mentioned scarab of Quinteye, the wife of Amenhotep III, no later uh, historical reference exists for the area around the Sea of Galilee. Amana letter 148-41 mentions that the king of Hazor has abandoned his house and aligned himself with the Apiru, but the site of Hazor was still settled. Evidently, the Apiru became a significant influence on the uh, become, uh, became a, a significant influence on this territory. Likely. This has to be connected with the abandonment of uh, sites like Kinneret, Tel Hadar, and Tel Dubia at the end of the late Bronze Age one period. For the following 50 years, no data exists for an active Egyptian foreign policy. Akhenaten was not willing to be active in Palestine, and his successors were likely no more able to organize a campaign to Palestine. We do not know if Pharaoh Harem Hab ever entered the inner territory of the Levant or if he was only interested in keeping the Egyptian influence alive along the Mediterranean coast. Only Ram uh, Seti I and Rameset II started new military campaigns in inland Palestine. The two Bechan Stela inform us about some rumors in the area of this town. While the first Stela mentions Egyptian military activities in Rechob, Hamad, Yenoam, and Pella, the second one informs us about problems with Rabiu groups settling just north of Bechean. 
the text mentions the mountain of Yarumtu, very likely the area around the still existing crusader fortress of Belvoir or Kokar Fayadim. Also, the, uh, there's a gap of several decades. The Khabir were still a dominant group in this region. Besides the military activities, another fact is even more important for the history of the region around the Sea of Galilee. Seti I and Ramesses II tried to replace the main uh, trade route connecting Egypt with northern Syria, the so-called Via, Via Maris, which is shown here in green, uh, by a new trade route east of the anti-Lebanon mountains. At least four, likely five, stela from Seti I and Ramesses II were discovered along this road. Although its continuation is rather hypothetical due to the missing proofs, this road bypasses, uh, bypassed Damascus and ended anywhere at the Euphrates River. By establishing this new trade route, the Egyptians avoided the hostile contact with the Hittites in northern Syria and with Apiro groups in northern Palestine. Trade always needs, needs safe conditions, and the political system in the northern Levant became too fragile for these trade uh, activities. In my opinion, we can observe three steps of Egyptian influence in Galilee during the Late Bronze Age. First, a strong Egyptian hegemony during the reign of Tutmosis III, which lasted until the early years of Amenhotep III. Then second, the reign uh, of this pharaoh, the Egyptians lost the control over Galilee. The Apiro became more dominant in the region. This resulted in the abandonment of several sites like Kinera, Tel Hadar, and Tel Duvia. Uh, meanwhile, the king of Hatzor joined the Abiru. If this is true, the end of the late Bronze Age I period in Galilee, not in the whole country, but in Galilee, should be dated to about uh, 1380 or 1360. And then third step, the re-establishment of Egyptian hegemony under Seti I and Ramesses II despite the fact uh, that, has, uh, that they never reigned complete uh, control over Galilee, uh, regained uh, complete control over Galilee. The main road system was transferred to the area east of the Anti-Lebanon mountains. Finally, such a huge site of Hazor, or the military, Egyptian military base, it Kamede Laws was abundant. Hazor lost its uh, economic subsistence, and Kamede Laws its military function. Later on, the new Galilean settlements founded during the LB2 period became the nucleus of the Iron Age tribes of Geshur, Naphtali, and Beit Macha. I hope the lectures and this historical reconstruction is a good starting point for a fruitful discussion, which starts actually now. <laughs> <laughs>